the fifth investigation of McCarthy. There will be a sixth, there will be a seventh and an eighth, as long as I continue to try to expose people who are traitors to this country. If I would quit now, why, we'd end with the fifth investigation, but take my word for it, my good friend, regardless, and I make you this solemn promise, regardless of what this Senate may do about a censure, this fight to expose those who would destroy this nation will go on and on. His name is Senator Joseph McCarthy, and this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace. This is Biography. Our story, Senator Joseph McCarthy. Even now, years after his death, the smoke of political battle swirls around the name of Senator Joe McCarthy. He is loved and hated, praised and damned. The debate still goes on over his significance on the American scene. Was he a dangerous demagogue or a courageous patriot? These are the events that made Senator McCarthy the most controversial politician of our time. And I may say that I am getting very, very weary of sitting here and acting as though we're playing some little game. And this committee, this committee, these activities may well determine whether this nation will live or die. We've got to clean out the, those who are responsible, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, those who are responsible, either knowingly or because they were simple dupes covering up communists and traitors, not dead ones, but live ones. He held the national spotlight for only four years. But those four years made his career one of the most significant stories in the history of American politics. Born in 1908 in Grand Chute, Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy grows up among hard-working farm people. Impatient and ambitious, he quits school, and by the time he's 19, McCarthy is the hard-driving manager of a grocery store, and he makes business boom. But at the age of 20, realizing that he is virtually uneducated, he enrolls as a freshman in high school. He graduates in a single year. Then McCarthy attends Marquette University. He is a good student, and he also becomes coach and star of the boxing team. He studies law, is elected president of his class, and with this taste of campus politics, he begins to think about a career in real politics. A young lawyer, he gets his chance. In 1939, at the age of 30, he is elected a certain he enlists in the Marine Corps and serves as an intelligence officer with a bombing squadron in the South Pacific. He also volunteers to go on combat missions as a tail gunner. After the war, McCarthy becomes a dark horse candidate in Wisconsin for the United States Senate. He is elected, and when he goes to Washington, he works hard, becomes involved in a few minor controversies, and demonstrates a flair for attracting publicity. But during his first few years in Washington, McCarthy, like most freshman senators, stays in the background. One day in 1950, however, he makes a speech, and the speech makes history. McCarthy publicly charges that the United States State Department is infested with communists, 
These dangerous communists, he warns, are helping to shape our foreign policy in the Cold War. And he says that he has a list of their names. McCarthy suddenly becomes a national figure. His accusations rock the Capitol. This unknown senator has dared accuse the State Department, has charged the Truman administration itself, is infiltrated by communists. A Senate committee launches a public investigation of McCarthy's charges. The most sensational case is that of Owen Lattimore, a prominent professor of history who is active in political circles. Lattimore, says McCarthy, is the top Russian spy, the key man in a Russian espionage ring. I am willing, says the senator, to stand or fall on the Lattimore case. Lattimore replies to McCarthy's charges. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. I have never been affiliated with or associated with the Communist Party. I have never believed in the principles of communism, nor subscribed to, nor advocated the communist or Soviet form of government, either within the United States, in China, in the Far East, or anywhere in the world. I trust that the senator's promise that he will retire from the arena if his charges against me fail is not as insincere as his twice-repeated promise to resign if he should fail to repeat his libelous accusations in a forum which would expose him to suit. I hope the senator will in fact lay his machine gun down. He is too reckless, careless, and irresponsible to have a license to use it. It is established that as an historian, Lattimore favored a conciliatory policy toward the Chinese communists and his writings have had some influence on American foreign policy. But Lattimore didn't work for the State Department. Also, the charge that he is a spy collapses. McCarthy also fails to prove that there are any Communist Party members in the State Department. But now he accuses many of being security risks. And 18 of those he names are, for various reasons, eventually separated from the State Department. The hearings make him one of the most controversial men in America. His opponents accuse him of wholesale character assassination. McCarthy supporters say that he has exposed the danger of communists and radicals on the national scene. McCarthy now takes repeated aim at the highest echelons in the Truman administration. Secretary of State Dean Acheson says McCarthy is guilty of aid to international communism over the past 20 years. Secretary of Defense George Marshall is part of a conspiracy, says McCarthy, so immense and an infamy so black as to dwarf any previous venture in the history of man. President Truman lashes back at McCarthy and McCarthyism. The growing practice of character assassination is already curbing free speech, and it is threatening all our other freedoms. For I know you have no way of telling when some unfounded accusation may be hurled at you, perhaps straight from the halls of Congress. It's the job of all of us, of every American who loves his country and his freedom, to rise up and put a stop to this terrible business. This is one of the greatest challenges we face today. We've got to make a fight for our real 100% Americanism. One communist on the faculty of one university is one communist too many. One communist among the Admir American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And even, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. 
By 1952, Senator McCarthy has seriously rattled the Democratic Party. In his own Republican Party, however, McCarthy's power soars. He is hailed at the 1952 Republican Convention. The election campaign in Wisconsin. McCarthy appears with the Republican presidential candidate Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower had planned here to praise his old friend, General George Marshall. But he doesn't. The night before, he was persuaded not to by Senator Joseph McCarthy and by his own advisors. Senator McCarthy is re-elected in 1952. He emerges as one of the most prominent political figures in the nation. At this moment, it would seem almost inconceivable that within only two more years, Senator Joseph McCarthy's career will reach its zenith, and then it will be suddenly destroyed. Nineteen fifty-three. Through the Senate seniority system, Senator Joseph McCarthy draws a key job, chairmanship of a Senate investigating committee, the Committee on Government Operations. Before this time, he had been fighting virtually a one-man battle against what he called 20 years of treason. Now he has a large staff and broad powers to investigate. The impact of McCarthyism is felt across the United States. The federal government launches new waves of security investigations. The requirement of a loyalty oath becomes increasingly widespread in the government and throughout the nation. As McCarthy approaches the peak of his political career, the senator marries. The senator's bride is Jean Kerr, who works on his research staff. It is a major social event in Washington. This will be one of the last tranquil interludes in McCarthy's life. McCarthy has now begun an investigation of reported spying and sabotage in the United States Army. During a tour of Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, he's accompanied by Secretary of the Army, Robert Stevens. I've been very much impressed by the forceful and aggressive action taken by the Commanding General, General Lawton, and by the very able Secretary of the Army in cleaning out what uh, appeared to have been a very, very bad situation. I think they've moved as rapidly as they possibly could. I think they're doing a good, thorough job, and I'd like to shake your hand on it, Bob. Thank you, Joe. McCarthy continues his investigation of the Army. When a general refuses to answer certain questions, McCarthy tells him that he is not fit to wear the Army uniform. McCarthy and the Army seem on the verge of warfare. Now, Secretary Stevens attends a meeting with McCarthy and his investigating committee. A meeting intended to make peace between McCarthy and the Army. Stevens agrees in a memorandum that McCarthy should continue his investigation. But within days, the conflict flares up again. I shall never accede to the abuse of Army personnel under any circumstances including committee hearings. I shall never accede to them being browbeaten beaten, or humiliated. If a stupid, arrogant, or witless man in a position of power appears before our committee and is found aiding the Communist Party, he will be exposed. The fact that he might be a general places him in no special class as far as I'm concerned. Finally, there is a showdown between McCarthy and the United States Army. A Senate subcommittee holds public hearings into the Army McCarthy controversy. Each day, television brings the battle to 20 million viewers across the nation. It is one of the most extraordinary spectacles in the history of American politics. I will not give those names to them when they say that our function 
in coming back on the committee is not to expose and prosecute communists. Senator, would you like to hear this? It's about you. The, the, they, in effect, say our function is not to expose... I'm always left to you, Senator communists. McCarthy, when I want her, and you they, always they you are, to me. Please, I want, when you ask me, and I'd say this, that I was listening now, to what Senator, you had to I'm say. Now, Senator, I'm going to face this. And it, you don't have to have everybody have looking it. at you all the time you're talking. <laughs> While our friend Sanctimonious Stu was advising, Senator Conley, I resent that reference to my first name. Advising, You're a, you better go to a psychiatrist. I want no psychological bribes from you. The truth you talk about, Senator. So if you want to, if you want to do that. You can take the stand. I'll sign step down right sign now. Sign the letter, I will Senator. not sign the letter with sign false statements. Sign the letter. Sir. Very simple. Sign the record. Mr. All you have to do is sign it. Don't, 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 we'll don't, don't pull, pull that. One at a time. Don't sign. pull that phony thing on sign me. Sign the letter. One at a time. There it is, Senator. It's got my signature on it. You have a document with false statements in it. I will not sign the agree that's true. Now, don't. Mr. You, Chairman, you're not fooling I'm anyone. Uh, you're letter. not fooling anyone, Mr. Symington. You're not fooling anyone. I have offered to go before any committee, do anything you ask, if I can just get you to come down here and take the oath so we can get the answers to some questions. Now, you're, not, you're not fooling anyone at all. Senator, I'm sure of that. Senator, let me tell you something. The chair believes that uh, we The understand. American people have had a look at you for six weeks. You're not fooling anyone either. Senator Potter. The Army's attorney is Joseph Welsh, a soft-spoken Bostonian was a dramatic contrast to McCarthy. But he, too, is a shrewd showman. Welsh tries for most of the hearing to hide his antagonism for McCarthy. But one day, the senator accuses Welsh of having an assistant who belonged to an organization reportedly sympathetic to communism. This is perhaps the most dramatic duel in the entire hearing. Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. If it were in my power to forgive you for your reckless cruelty, I would do so. I like to think I'm a gentle man. But your forgiveness will have to come from someone other than me. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, may, may I say that uh, Mr. Welsh talks about this being cruel and reckless. He was just baiting. He has been baiting. Senator, uh, may we not finish. drop this? Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Well, let's, let's, You've let's, done let's, enough. Have right. you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? This, I know this hurts you, Mr. Welch. I'll but say may, it may, hurts. May I say, Mr. Chairman, Mr. as a point of personal privilege, uh, I'd like to finish this. Senator, I think it hurts you too, I'd, sir. I'd like to finish this. Uh, Mr. Mr. Welch here has been filibustering this hearing. He's been talking day after day about the way he wants to get anyone tainted with communism out before sundown. Mr. McCarthy, Mr. I will not discuss it further. I will not ask Mr. Cohen any more witnesses. You, Mr. Chairman, may, if you will, call the next witness. Are there any questions to come from the uh, end of the chair? At the end of the hearing, McCarthy is mildly rebuked for his conduct in the investigation of the Army but there are more ominous consequences. Political forces in both parties are now marshalling against McCarthy. They feel that he has gone too far, that he must be stopped. An extraordinary measure, rarely taken in the history of the United States Senate, is taken against Senator McCarthy. November, 1954. The United States Senate holds a debate on a motion to censure Joseph McCarthy. The charges against him, contempt of the Senate and its committees, 
abuse of fellow senators, abuse of an army general. At the end of the debate, the Senate rules that McCarthy be censured. McCarthy, who has injured his arm in a recent accident, is still defiant. Senator, do you think this will ruin your political career? <laughs> no. Uh, I don't think the American people are at all fooled. They know that I'm being censured because I dared to expose communism, treason, and government. Senator, do you feel that you have uh, not been censured in this action? I wouldn't say that uh, today was a vote of confidence. Officially denounced by his fellow senators, much of his prestige and power are suddenly gone. He continues to hammer away at the communist issue, but he no longer commands headlines. McCarthy loses the spotlight even faster than he had captured it. President Eisenhower, who has been a behind-the-scenes force against McCarthy, now delivers the final blow. The senator and Mrs. McCarthy are banned from all social events held by the president. The senator's health begins to fail, and his enemies circulate stories in Washington that he is ruining himself with drink. His critics claim that he is just a demagogue who lost his nerve after his first major defeat. But his friends say that McCarthy is disillusioned and hurt, that he has lost his will to live, that he feels betrayed by men he thought were his friends. Early in 1957, the McCarthys adopt a baby girl and name her Tierney Elizabeth. And McCarthy talks about leaving politics to take up ranching in Arizona. But it is too late. Joseph McCarthy dies on May 2nd, 1957. The cause of death is hepatitis. He was 49 years old. A funeral service is held in Washington, the scene of his most bitter controversies. Then Joe McCarthy is taken back home to Appleton, Wisconsin. Only seven years before, as an unknown freshman senator, McCarthy began a political battle that shook the entire nation. Now, Joseph McCarthy's battles are over. The end came quickly to the power and prestige of Senator Joseph McCarthy. And perhaps during his stormy career, he himself felt that this would be his fate. In his office, Joe McCarthy had a prayer framed on the wall. It read, God, don't let me weaken. Help me to continue on. And when I go down, let me go down like an oak tree felled by a woodsman's axe. Mike Wallace for Biography. <laughs>